the 34th annual Topeka West High School Heritage Week celebration. And if you're unfamiliar, clear back in 1988, the librarian that at the time, his name was Mike Prince, and he had this dream that every year we would select a country or a culture, and we would learn about it, talk about it, celebrate it with music, art, lecture, books. And his idea was that once we know more about other places, other people, other cultures, we're more likely to understand them, to tolerate people who are different, to appreciate what we have to learn, and grow from that experience. So if you look around the library, you see all these pictures um, hung around, and every painting, sculpture, um, artwork represents a different year in our Heritage Week celebration. These are selected by you, students at Topeka West, by voting, and hopefully many of you have already, already voted. Um, the winning artwork created by the Topeka West students is purchased by the library and on permanent display here in this space. So we are so proud of our long history of participation in Heritage Week. It's something, we're the only people who do this. So it's really something that I am proud of. Further, this year, from the museum to the commercials and um, the Jewish class did bookmarks, we have all kinds of individual projects that students have created around their knowledge about Hawaii. And those are on the library homepage. So if you have time and you want to see a commercial made about hula dancing by one of your peers, it's there for you to check out on our website. Okay, um, without further ado, I want to introduce you to our special guest this morning. Dr. Tracy Wagner is a professor at Washburn University, and she's going to speak to you today about a different aspect of Hawaii. And I'll, I'll let her go on with that introduction. Thank you all so right, much for coming today. So first of all, thank you guys for coming, and maybe you didn't know you were going to get to come in here, but thanks for coming anyway. It makes me feel good to have people here and, and getting a chance to speak to you. Many of you may know me as Patience's mom. All right, depending upon how long or what school system you've gone through, you may know me as the crazy lady that brought body parts to school when you were in second grade or third grade or something like that. Okay. Normally, what I do is teach about physiology, but. When I was talking to Ms. Carnes and she was talking about Heritage Week, I do teach a little bit of biology as well, because I'm in the biology department at Washburn. And I said, hey, I could probably do something along those lines. So I want to make sure you know I am not an expert on the coral reefs in Hawaii. I did a lot of research. I've got a slide at the end that shows all the different places that I went to get my facts and my figures and pictures. So you can see that I had to do a lot of research for this. All right. What I want to try to get you to be convinced of is the fact that even though we are in Kansas, which has the largest beaches of any state in the US, you guys know that, right? We've got more coastline between us and any ocean than any place else in the US. Okay, that's a joke, but um, <laughs> Wow, okay. Wake up, you gotta get used to my party sense of humor. This will be a whole lot funnier if you do that, okay? So. Even if you're here in the middle of Kansas, you should still care about stuff that happens elsewhere. All right? So just out of curiosity, how many of you have gone someplace, lived, left Kansas, been someplace else in the US? All right, that's good. How many of you have left the country to go visit someplace else? A little bit smaller group of people. OK. If you have never done either of those, that doesn't mean that you can't. My dad grew up in Cuna, Idaho. Population 2,000. Oh, wait, somebody died, 1,999. Somebody got married and moved in with the kids. Now we're 2001. Literally, that was his upbringing. When I was in college, I got a chance on a scholarship to go to live in France for a semester. And my mom was bound and determined that we were all going to come and go. And my dad said, why would we do that? And at the end of the trip, he recognized the importance of travel. And since then, they've gone to travel to Russia and China and all sorts of other things. It is possible for everyone. 
If you're thinking, I don't know what I want to do, you can get scholarships towards college by going around the U.S. and working places. And I can help get you that information. <coughs> Counselors can help you get that information. But you've got more opportunities than you may think you do if you haven't left Kansas yet. All right? So this is a little bit of, hey, we're moving forward, and this is what I want to do. Looking at our coral reefs, uh, we're going to do a quick shift here. Oh, wow. that, that's my fault. I should have checked to see where the words were lining up on the screen. There we go. So why should you care about coral reefs? As we just pointed out, we don't have a whole lot of this in Kansas, right? Nobody has a coral reef growing in their backyard? No. All right. So they provide a huge, yeah, do you have a coral reef? No, I was going to ask if I go to the restroom. Oh. oh. Yes. That's something to ask one of the other faculty members. All right. So they provide a great diversity of life. We know that rainforests provide huge diversity of life. This is basically the rainforest of the ocean. So you can't see it, but it's still got hundreds of thousands of different species of living organisms down there. Right? They physically protect the shorelines. Think about sand. When you spray water on sand, what happens to the sand? It starts being pushed away, right? Sand is not stable. That's why you talk about shifting sands. If you build something on sand, it's going to start to fall apart. We need these coral reefs to protect the shoreline. Who would want to go to Hawaii if there's no beaches? Okay, maybe a couple people. But the beaches are a big uh, draw for tourists, so we need those for there. They also provide a lot of economic value for the people living there, not just because of tourism, but in terms of food intake, all right? All right, so we've got a few questions here. You guys are gonna have to vote. That means you have to pay attention. I know, difficult thing. Are corals a plant or an animal? We're gonna take a vote, just stop and think. How many of you would vote that corals are a type of plant? How many would vote they're a type of animal? Woo! Okay, science teachers around the world be glad, yay! They are indeed an animal, all right? So, this is not what all corals look like. It's a horrible cartoon drawing, but it gives you a rough idea. We're gonna look at that a little bit more in a moment. How big is an individual coral organism? Is it measured on the order of centimeters or inches? Is that the appropriate measurement for it? Decimeters or feet? Meters or yards? Hold on. We, we, have, we have somebody who's trying to use phone a friend in reverse. How many people would vote for the centimeters inches? How many people vote for decimeters and feet? Okay, we've got a few there. I think you may have influenced some people. How about meters or yards? Okay, now here's the thing. I didn't think I was gonna have to give a civics lesson. It's important to vote. A lot of you didn't vote just now. Let's try it one more time. Centimeters, inches, decimeters, feet, meters, yards. There should be a lot more hands going up. Okay. Well, I saw one hand go up for the centimeters, inches. You win a pineapple. Woo! <laughs> centimeters or inches, and that's in their height, their diameter. All right, so if we look at this, the diameter across the base is about as thick as a skewer you would use for shish kebab, millimeters. These are tiny little creatures. Tiny little creatures, sorry, they might tiny too big. So how is it then that we see these huge, giant coral reefs if they're only that big? Well, we've got this great life cycle, okay? And I apologize, I should not have used this format of the, the PowerPoint. But we start off already established coral colonies. We'll release a bunch of sperm and oocytes out into the ocean at the same time. They find each other, and basically the sperm fertilize the oocytes form the beginnings of a polyp, and we're missing the side edge here, but basically this turns into an individual polyp. Those polyps start to reproduce asexually, i.e. they bud off and form another identical clone to themselves, and eventually you get a whole colony. Each polyp 
is actually producing a lot of calcium carbonate. Basically make a skeleton that's on the outside and they keep building that and growing that. So when you were saying meters, you were thinking about the big calcium carbonate structure, not the individual polyps, okay? When we look then, this makes a little bit more sense in terms of how the organism is living. So we've got this little tiny organism, all right, with the tentacles waving around. It's established or solid on the base, so it's not gonna go anywhere. Then it waves its tentacles around. When nutrition comes around, it brings it into its mouth, and it's only got two layers of cells. One that's on the outside, one that's on the inside. So no, no heart, no stomach. This is called its gastrovascular cavity. It's a combined heart or, or circulation and stomach. Also notice we only have one opening. So basically, when the coral are eating, they bring stuff in and then they vomit out whatever's left. Okay? Just be grateful you don't have to do that on a regular basis. So the food comes in, they vomit it out, keep doing that to get their nutrition. I like this image because it shows you the larger coral structure, but you can see each of these little white things is a little individual polyp. So you can see how the individual polyps are making up this ginormous structure. They all have to work together to get the structures or the things that we see in terms of corals. So, we've discovered that there are a plant, sorry, not a plant, an animal. We've discovered that they're very small, and we've talked a little bit about their nutrition. So this is a zoomed in picture of an individual coral polyp. There's another little one right there. We noted that they were stable, and so they're relying on the ocean currents to help bring food by, but they do have a couple other things. So some of them have stinging cells on their tentacles that they can use to throw out little barbs at things that come by. And then almost all of them have a symbiotic relationship with dinoflagellates or zoanthella. okay? So let's look at, these tentacle cells are pretty cool, I think. They're found on the surface of the tentacle and there's this little hair trigger, all right? the nidocil. So when some organism comes up and bumps that nidocil, it's like triggering a spring. Uh, yes, but slightly different because the Venus flytrap is gonna close around it and pull it in before it starts to do anything. This is going to try to drag it towards it, okay? So the little bark thing goes out, stinging, and then it's still connected to the polyp by that little thread so it can hold it in and then the tentacles can bring the food stuff in. Lest you think, oh, what a big deal. This tiny little thing has these stinging cells. Anybody ever been stung by a jellyfish? All right, what happens when you get stung by a jellyfish? It hurts. It hurts. It is really, really painful, okay? If you watch Finding Nemo, everybody knows Finding Nemo still, right? Okay. <laughs> And the scene where they're going through and they're having to avoid the jellyfish because if you get too many things, you die. That's basically what these are. Corals and jellyfish are near relatives, and so they have some of the same mechanisms that they're going to use to hunt or gather prey. So that's our little stinging tentacles, or the cells that allow for the stinging tentacles. Then these are some of the dinoflagellates. They're also known as algae, right? Everybody's heard of algae at some point? Yes, hopefully you've heard about algal blooms. Okay, so that's basically, now these are the zo, uh, zoosanthin, all right? But the dinoflagellates have little radella on them that they can help move themselves around. These plant-type cells, algae, get into the polyp cells and they work together. So they grow together to provide protection for each other. So, we've looked at the organism. Now let's look at the importance of the coral reefs. All right? Did I mention I teach at a university? Normally I know all my kids' names. I don't know all your names, so some of you I'm just gonna have to harass and say, hey, the kid in the gray cap, thank you. When we're looking at the coral reefs, these are true false statements. You guys have to tell me if you think it's true or false. Coral reefs provide $200 million to Hawaii's economy every year. 
How many of you think, yeah, that sounds like that's true? All right, how many of you think, say, no way? No way, Jose. No way, Jose. Okay, do you think it's more or less? More or less, sir, Mr. Red Gap? Uh. <laughs> You feel like it's less. Okay, how many agree with him? How many would say, oh yeah, it's less than that. 200 million, that's a lot of money. Every year. We think it's less, we think it's more. This is like price is right. Okay? How many people say it's less? How many people say it's more? All right. Wait, I got a question. Yeah. How do they provide money? I don't know. Hold on, we'll get there, we'll get there. It's false. It's $800 million a year. Four times as much. And on top of that, remember I said we've got the protective value of the coral, preventing the damage to the ocean or to the uh, shores? They think it costs an additional $836 million if they had to keep repairing all the beaches from the protection, if they didn't have the protection from the coral reefs. Huge economic value to the islands. They've got a lot invested in keeping the coral reefs going. All right? Next statement. 85% of the coral reefs that belong to the United States are found in Hawaii. How many people think that's true? How many people think that's false? Okay? If you're thinking it's false, why do you think it's false? Yeah, defend your opinion. Yeah, why do you think it's false? Okay. So he's pointing out, we've got Florida and California, we've got a lot of other Bay Areas. Hawaii is such a small space, it's got to be other places. It's actually true. They do, we do have 85% of our coral reefs are found there in Hawaii. Okay? So we've got a lot invested in protecting them because they're all located in a fairly small space. Does that stuff get transported here? Can the coral reefs get transported here? We will talk about that near the end, okay? I know, you're going to have to hold on to all of this stuff. Okay, coral wheat reefs in Hawaii are homes to hundreds of endemic species. If you're not familiar with the term endemic, you might have heard it because we've been talking about a pandemic, and now we think COVID might become endemic, meaning it's going to be here all the time. An endemic species is one that is native to an area and cannot be found anywhere else. All right, so in other words, if we lose their habitat, we lose those species because they don't live anywhere else. All right, how many people think that's true? How many people think, no, that's false? No, it's true. It's false. They're home to thousands of endemic species. All right, so if we lose the coral reefs, we are losing thousands of organisms that cannot be found anywhere else. So, symbiotic, we mentioned that term before. You guys have probably heard it in biology classes when you had it. But two different organisms living in close relationship with each other in a long-term biological reaction. They've got a partnership of some sort. Now, are all partnerships uh, equal? No. So. So what people most commonly think of is mutualism, where both species are getting something out of the arrangement, okay? There's also commensalism, where one gets something, the other's like, eh, no skin off my back, no harm, no foul. But only one is benefiting. And then there's parasitism, where one is actively taking something from the other, okay? But when we look at the algae or the dinoflagellates or the zooxanthella that's in the coral, that's a mutualistic relationship. So the coral provides protection. Remember all that calcium carbonate, the structure around it. That helps protect the algae so that they can keep multiplying and living. The algae provide energy for the coral to survive. So it truly is a mutualistic relationship. Okay. In addition, the coral also provides habitat for all these smaller organisms in the reef, a place to hide, a place to lay eggs a place to get some uh, additional nutrition from. So they've tied the livelihood or the ability to live to 25% of all marine life is based on the coral reef. So if you lose the coral reef, whoop, wipe out 25% of the organisms there. This is a horrible cheesy card. There was a free download so you can spot things in Hawaii, creatures in Hawaii. 
But what I like about it is in one quick stroke, they're showing you lots of different fish that you might find in the coral reefs there. The other thing, and I know this is kind of small and hard to see, anything with a little red star is found only in Hawaii, okay? And you see lots of different fish there that have that little red star next to them. So even on just a quick snapshot of the most common fish you can find, you see lots that are endemic to Hawaii. So it sounds like coral reefs are this awesome paradise. People, not people, organisms are living in mutualism. I'll give to you, you give to me. Hey, life is great. Except there are also predators for coral. All right? So this is a crown of thorns sea star. This is actually one of the biggest predators of coral that you find on coral reefs. And they talk about the fact that this is becoming a huge issue. One crown of thorns sea star, and I like this picture a little bit better because you can see all the thorns or the protrusions see them that look like thorns on it. One crown of thorns sea star can eat a square meter of coral a month. How long is it going to take for a population of sea stars to be able to go through and wipe out a huge chunk of a coral reef? Not very long. Okay. These have always been around. We've always had a few of them. It's been okay because there were also predators that would eat the, the crown of thorns sea stars. And so again, a little bit of destruction, but enough coral to regrow. What we're going to find is that as the coral reefs are weakened by other things like climate change, like pollution, etc., then it makes it easier for these crown of thorn sea stars to grow and finish wiping out the populations. So here come humans. We like to explore. We like to see everything. We like to conquer all. And that means we end up doing a lot of damage and destruction, even if we're not intending to. Okay? So scuba divers, even if they're not going down and breaking off little samples of coral shell to take home, even if they are not purposely doing anything, just swimming along through the reef creates some enough current to shift some of the ecosystem around the corals. Remember, the corals can't move. So if you suddenly brush a bunch of uh, sediment in their area, that may disrupt their ability to survive. What happens, what do scuba divers wear on their backs and on their, their legs? What's their equipment? Awesome. Big tanks and the fins. Have you ever put on fins to try to swim? Are you totally aware of where all the fins are? Because all of a sudden your foot's a lot longer than it used to be. So they accidentally will knock into the coral. The tanks will knock off some coral. So even if you're not purposely trying to do anything, there's still damage that's being done. We like to have fresh fish, and it's sure a lot faster to put down a net and just scrape it along and grab whatever's there. And when they do that, that knocks off a lot of the coral that are resting on the bottom of the floor. There's also runoff from the islands. Everybody's going to go visit Hawaii, and that creates more pollution. And then when the rain comes, all the stuff gets washed down. That has a chance to damage the coral. Those first three things are things that are happening locally there, all right? which leaves us with climate change, and that's affecting everything. That's affecting us here in Kansas, right? Anybody been watching the weather recently and looking at how dry it is and how we haven't had enough rain and how that shifts the weather patterns? It happens to us here, it's happening to them there. So let's look a little bit at that climate change, okay? It causes what we call coral bleaching. So here's a coral when it's healthy, Here's one that has undergone an increase in temperature event that leads to the coral bleaching. You can see it looks like it's white now, right? All the coral's been removed from that. Basically that happens because a lot of the color comes from the algae that are living inside the polyps or living inside the coral organism, okay? And so when it gets too warm, the coral basically remove, they kick out the algae from their cells and then that causes them to become white or bleached out looking, okay? If the water cools back down, they can bring the algae back in. But for that period of time, they can't do that. Now, wait, why else is the algae important besides it, it provides color? What else did the algae do? What did we say? It provides energy, it's providing nutrition. So hey, I'm getting rid of this thing, but I just kicked out a major food source. Okay, so here's what happens when we look at our timeline. 
the increased um, temperature makes the algae start to grow faster. And if the algae are growing faster, they're using more nutrients for themselves, giving less to the coral. So it goes from being a symbiotic relationship to be not so beneficial to the coral, all right? Almost parasitic. So the algae are getting more than the coral are. At that point, the coral says, ha, I don't need you. I'm going to kick you out, okay? Secondly, let's just stop and think for a moment. What is one of the number one things pregnant women complain about when they get really, really big? They're back. Well, no. <laughs> I was going to say they're back, actually. Okay, well, they're back, yes. Their they're back does complain. They get really hungry. Okay, they get really hungry, so they're needing more nutrition. And what else? Cravings. Okay, well, that goes with cravings. Gosh. Woo! You guys are coming with great ideas, but you're not reading my mind. Come on, let's get all on the same channel. When the, when the baby kicks her stomach. Okay. <laughs> Come on. You guys got to help me out here. What else do pregnant women complain about? It's hot. It's hot. Absolutely. They've got another organism in there that's producing a lot of heat. And now we've got the coral. It's kind of like a pregnant woman. The environment around them is getting warmer than it should be. And they've got this other metabolism inside their cells that's creating heat. So let's get it out so I don't have to be quite so warm. So the corals kick the algae out, or the dinoflagellates, or the zoanthella, all right? But then the corals die because, hey, they kicked out their food source. And if they don't get them back within a couple of months, they don't have enough energy stored from other things to survive. So basically, they're killing themselves when they skip out or push out the algae. All right? Once the corals die, then we lose the protection from the wave erosion. Then we lose the habitat for the fish. Now we have fewer fish in the area. And all the organisms that are connected to each other start to die because of that loss. All right? So short term, we can recover. We can see a reef recover within a couple of months if it's a short term heat event, i.e., a sudden a wave or current comes by and it's warm for a few days and it cools back down, no problem. The coral reefs can recover. But it'll take them months to recover from that short-term event. <coughs> Here we see some coral that are trying to get their algae back. All right? And you might say, hey, I thought you said they'd be bleached and that sure doesn't look bleached. Well, what scientists have discovered is that some algae don't like to go back, well, most of the algae don't like to go back into the bleach plants. Or not the bleach plants, sorry, the bleach coral. Woo! The algae are the plants. They don't like going back into the bleach coral. Because when they get in there, there's so much light around, it makes it hard for them to reestablish. And so some of the corals have started putting energy into putting out really bright pigments that absorb some of that light to help attract the algae back in and say, hey, you want to come live here? Isn't this amazing, Topeka West colors? Who wouldn't want to live in a Topeka West coral reef? Right? So they do that. The other thing is that once the algae move back in, then they go back to their normal coloration. But this is a strategy to attract and protect those coral plants from being overheated while they're waiting for the algae to move back in. If it's a localized loss, like, hey, scuba diver went by and knocked out a place, or they dragged the fishing nets through and got rid of some of the coral, then remember when we looked at that reproduction cycle. Nearby populations of coral can release the sperm and the oocytes, and they'll go repopulate that way. They'll just start new colonies from nearby. The problem is, if it's not a small area, or it's not a short period of time, when we see long-term temperature increases, which is what we're seeing with climate warming, all right, or global warming, and if it happens over large areas, you're not just changing one tiny part of the ocean. You're changing the entire ocean. Anybody here remember what the specific heat of water is? Do you know what specific heat is? All right, specific heat is the amount of energy. Okay, yes, sir. 70 degrees is a thermal neutral temperature, so that's a good guess, but specific heat tells us the amount of energy it takes to raise a certain amount of water of one degree centigrade, okay? So one cubic centimeter, or one milliliter, 
takes one calories worth of energy to be raised one degree centigrade. How many milliliters do you think there are in the ocean? A lot. So how much energy has been poured into the ocean to raise the whole ocean 1.1 degrees centigrade? A lot. We are not going to get rid of all that energy right away. The ocean is storing that heat for us at the cost of the organisms living in it. All right, so in that case, it's going to take decades. In other words, there are coral reefs that were harmed by a bleaching event before you were born that still have not recovered. The other thing scientists have found is that the growth of the coral actually slows down when the temperature is warmer. So instead of growing faster and be able to catch back up, it's growing more slowly, which means it's going to take even longer. All right? So this does not look good. But just because, as humans, we've caused the damage doesn't mean we can't also help. So here's some things that are happening. First, let's stop doing so much damage to the reefs. If you don't do the damage, you don't have to recover from it. And so what we've seen is that they are now passing laws in Hawaii banning certain types of sunscreen because there's chemicals in the sunscreen that we put on to protect ourselves that are actually damaging the coral. So they're changing what kind of sunscreens you can use. They're changing diving regulations, and that's what we see here. So now that you see this diver being kind of pulled along over the surface, but not having to kick or move limbs, which means you're going to have less damage to the coral reef. You can see the coral reef without potentially damaging it. We can all start decrease pollution and runoff, also trying to put up barriers to prevent that. We can also slow the bleaching process by helping to find algae that are more heat tolerant. So scientists are now researching that, genetically modifying some algae and injecting it back into the coral polyps so that they will have algae that they don't have to spit out when the water gets warm. And last but not least, they're discovering that some coral are better at helping the, the reefs recover from bleaching events than others. So this is called a tabletop coral. You can see how it looks like a table with a big broad top. They found that when they can get tabletop coral established in reefs, the reef will cover 14 times faster. So it'll do in one year what other reefs are doing in 14 years. That's going to dramatically increase the rate of recovery. Okay? And even when these die, they still provide some shelter or shade for fish and other smaller corals to plant underneath them. So even if they don't stay there permanently, they still provide some advantages moving forward. Okay? So if you get the right kinds of coral, the other thing is that they're starting to look at moving coral from different places. Yeah. Diversity keeps everything alive. And so if you lose a bunch of diversity in one area, you can bring it in from others. And that's another thing that they're looking at. They're also looking at faster growing coral. So pine trees, typically the first trees that grow back in the forest because they're really fast, then the slower growing ones will go. We have faster growing corals, so they're looking to put faster growing corals to the reefs to help provide quicker recovery and some sort of shelter. All right, this is my last slide, and just this is a Hawaiian proverb. The land is the chief, man is its servant. We need to make sure we're taking care of the land and the world rather than just utilizing it, because otherwise we're all going to die. Such a lovely cause of ending thought for uh, our lecture, right? If you want anything, I Miss Carnes is going to have the presentation. So these are all the different websites you can go to and link to other things. I really like this Coral Reef Alliance. That led me to a lot of these other spots. All right, Miss Carnes, I'm trying really hard to remember what time we have to kick people out. Are we? Well, okay, I was thinking I was getting pretty close. Four minutes. Okay, so does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? I love that one site of bad romance, climate change, creation, Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> There's a lot of fun things. So, we've got some more pineapples, just so you know. More pineapple key things. So, I tell you what, if you ask those good questions that I know you have, those good questions and you've been tuning in so you have good questions, we have a few more pineapples that we would love to share with you. So share your good questions with Dr. Wagner because this is a unique What's your good question? Okay, go ahead. 
Start going. What about the transporting one? You yeah, asked yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so can you transport coral from other areas? Absolutely. So that's what we're talking about in terms of the recovery, right? That you can get coral from different reefs. For example, the picture that showed the scuba diver being dragged along, that was actually from the Great Barrier Coral Reefs over in Australia. And they're discovering that they can bring some of the coral from there back and plant it in other places. Yes, sir. Um, what kind of chemicals make the coral reefs die? What kind of chemicals make the coral reefs die? That is a list way too long to go into, but really quickly I'll give you one major one. All right? Carbon dioxide. What do all of you produce? Carbon dioxide. The living organisms, the fish and everything are also producing carbon dioxide. But the algae, the algae utilize the carbon dioxide because they're more closely related to plants, so they bring in the carbon dioxide and store it for us. When we lose the algae that are in the coral, then carbon dioxide levels go up and the ocean becomes more acidic or more basic. Does carbon dioxide make things acidic or basic? Acidic. acidic. All right? And when it becomes more acidic, then what's that going to do to our calcium carbonate? Build it or dissolve it? Dissolve it. Dissolve it. So all those shells that were produced are starting to dissipate. All right, so I have a question back here and then. What if I don't have a question and I just really want to find out that? I'll let you debate in this car so you can do some wonderful service thing for that later. Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> ah, that's a good question. What animals can help the coral reefs grow? The reality is almost anything can do that because we're looking to add diversity. So if you, for example, added predators that kill the crown of thorn sea star, then you will help the coral reefs grow, okay? As long as we're adding diversity, it's probably better. The problem comes when we get too narrow of a series of populations there. Oh. How do they move the coral? Well, remember I said in the polyp stage, if they get them when they've first been formed, then they can move those little polyps and basically receive the new area, okay? Because once you get that one polyp, you don't need to have sexual reproduction anymore. It can just start budding off. Is, here is my general answer to everything in life. Too much of anything can be bad, all right? So there is such a thing as too much coral, but most of the time we're not going to have that problem because there's so many things right now destroying the coral, okay? All right, I suspect we're past our four minutes now. Okay, so I have one request that you, first of all, you do every question. I saw you secretly answering every question. Yeah, AJ. Hey, you. Why you didn't say yes, that? This kid working. was quietly answering. So science teacher. Man, like, AJ. AJ. <laughs> Holy cow! <laughs> <laughs> I was just watching you answer the question. Mom is a friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my son. 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 <laughs> well, I don't know how you think that. But anyway, I'm impressed. So, what I need you to do, what I need you to do, please, listen up, one more thing. Your seminar teachers have posted links for you to go out and vote. And I hope they have. If they have not, you can drop me a line and I will send you that link directly. But it's very important that we hear, this is your opportunity to be involved. Involved in here, which is the gap is about half not. Oh. So I love it. Yeah, like you're in college. Sit down, wait. <laughs> Even if you know everything already, the bell will ring. I need you to vote because, hey, you get a voice up here this week. And next year, still cool. We had, we had students involved in the planning of Heritage Week. If this looks like something that would be fun for you, if you want to help decide where we travel to next year, then please just stop by and talk to me or send me an email and we'll put you on the Heritage Week committee. I would love it and I need the help and it would be a good time. Okay, can we all please give um, Dr. Wagner a round of applause and thank you. Thank you for returning. I appreciate that.